Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, welcome to Liberty Me You. We're here tonight with Terry Moore. Uh, she's the author of a book that is free this month for Liberty Me members called The Secular Homeschooler. So we're going to be talking to her more about that. Uh, Terry has served in the, the Peace Corps as a teacher and as a police officer in the U.S. Army and the LAPD. She has a BA in English from the Evergreen State College. She's a veteran homeschooling mother of two and now works as a freelance writer and editor. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Terry. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Terry Moore, and I'm here to tell you about my book, The Secular Homeschooler, and have a little discussion about homeschooling or um, just about education in general. Um, I think we have, you know, we all understand that schools these days have some problems, um, and, and we're not satisfied with them. Uh, those people who are satisfied with them, uh, you know, they're not seeking anything else uh, because they're happy with, with what's going on. But uh, those of us who aren't happy with the education that our kids are getting or maybe the environment our kids are in in public schools or in even in private schools are looking increasingly to homeschooling. But sometimes it can be really hard because we ourselves often came from the public school paradigm. So when we bring our kids home, we perpetuate the same paradigm at home. And I'm, you know, I'm here to tell you that, that we don't have to do that. And uh, it puts a big uh, burden on parents to think that they do have to follow the school curriculum and uh, do things at home as, as they are done in, in the classroom. And in fact, it's much better not to, because if you don't have to do that, why would you? Uh, so um, I think all of us are, you know, as parents, we're all worried about our kids. We're worried that they're going to get out in the world and not be able to function or um, have a hard time. And, and it makes us worry, and it keeps us up at night. Uh, we all have it. I have it. I have a little wrinkle right here, and it's from my kids. It's from being worried that my kids are going to get out in the world and uh, not be successful in the sense that they develop goals and, and have the drive to uh, see those goals through um, or just have the common sense to get through every day. And, and the problem is that when we send our kids to school, they're in school all day long, and they're not having normal experiences. Um, sitting in a classroom with all of the people that, you know, you associate with being your exact same age and being taught to uh, memorize things that, that you don't really see any need for, um, this is not normal life. And the problem is, is that our kids aren't getting life experience. So in order to give them time to have life experience, we, it's best if we bring them home. We can also do it uh, for kids who are in school. Parents can do it after school hours. Um, just make sure that their kids are part of everyday life, are, are doing daily activities. I'm talking about the daily things that we all do that everybody needs to know how to do. Uh, doing, uh, figuring out how to do your laundry, knowing how to fix broken things, um, sort of troubleshooting your way through problems in everyday life. Those kinds of things. Going to the grocery store, living within your means, those kinds of things. Um, we don't have time for our kids to learn because they're too busy. Um, memorizing their multiplication tables, and then at night we lie looking at the ceiling, being worried because we know that they're learning their multiplication tables and not learning how to troubleshoot problems in the world. So um, through this book, I'm trying to help 
uh, parents, I cheer them on, number one, and tell them, yes, you can do this. You're a functioning adult, so you know how to do this, number one. Number two, you love your child more than anyone, and so you're the best teacher, right? And number three, every kid needs something different. They're all getting the same things in school, but every kid really needs something different. Uh, you know, a kid may be able to do one thing and, and not another, and we all have um, a collection of things that we need help on, and then other things that come very easily to us that we don't need help on. And so, if when we bring our kids home, we're, we're able to tackle that better. Part of this also has to do with our, our social environment and our, our environment, our relationship with our government. Um, our government increasingly doesn't want our children to have any experiences. Um, they're, they're not allowed to walk to school. They're not allowed to work. Um, they're, they're not allowed to do a lot of things. Parents uh, are increasingly being prosecuted for allowing their kids to be out in the world in a way that I was allowed to be when I was growing up. So. Um, the government isn't helping us here, and so we still have to work around that and find ways for our kids to have the experiences that they need. So we're worried that our kids will have bad experiences, and so we keep them home and shelter them, and then they don't have any experiences, and, and then they don't know how to handle life. And then we get worried, and we get wrinkles, like this one right here. Uh, so. I think um, we need to look at that, if only so that we parents can sleep better at night. Uh, we need to help our children figure out what they, need, what they need in life, what they need to learn. And they're not going to know this until they have experiences with people of all ages, um, with um, being lost. That teaches you a lot, being lost. Um, uh, having to do something yourself, having to solve a problem, having to build something yourself. Um, all of these things teach us a lot. Um, and they're, they're practical things and practical experiences. Uh, and when we bring our kids home, we have time to do those things. As well, I think every family has a culture, uh, as if maybe that they were like a country or or uh or an ethnicity every every people or every family has some kind of culture to them you know either maybe they they have a hobby that they like maybe they love to go hiking uh on these big backpacking trips um maybe they uh they're very interested in the ocean um maybe um they have ties with another country um, that their, answer, their, their uh, family still lives in. Maybe the grandparents live way back in um, some other country, you know, uh, Thailand or something. And, and then it's important that the kids learn Thai so they can communicate with their grandparents. Every family is different. So when we bring our kids home, we can have time to work on those things that make us different. Uh, the government would have us believe that we all need our children to be in school for eight hours a day to learn the same basic load of knowledge. And it's just not true. Uh, we can all learn different things, and we all should learn different things. Um, and each family has particular things they need to work on. I think most parents have a, a particular book that they want to discuss with their child. They have a particular activity that's really important to them um, that, they, that they want to share with their children. We need enough time to do this, uh, time to be a family. So, so um, that's, that's part of what my book is talking about. Uh, the, the secular part, um, let me talk about that for a moment. Um, there are many books out there that are faith-based for homeschoolers because many homeschoolers are faith-based. 
and that's fine. Um, and a lot of those books uh, talk about how one would homeschool in order to um, in order to teach uh, the tenets of a certain faith. Okay, um, but but as homeschooling becomes more and more mainstream, there are many parents who are not wanting to homeschool in a faith-based environment, and um, or maybe they are atheists or um, just don't want to go there in their homeschooling. So um, once again, part of the experiences of life are learning um, through having things happen to you, what you think is right in the world and what you think is wrong. And uh, I think secular homeschooling parents are interested in their children figuring that out for themselves. If, you know, a parent being there to talk when, and when their child wants to talk about it. But um, our kids are going to have different a different code than than we have a different code of ethics um, slightly different we, we're all slightly different in the way that we look at things and um, when when we're allowing our kids to have experiences that, and they can build their own code based on what they see in the world instead of having us just tell them how to think and tell them what to believe, which is really all we're left with. If our kids are in school all day and then they come home and they have homework and then there's dinner and there's just no time for them to have life experiences and develop them themselves. So I think it's important for them to have experiences that allow them to interact with people and learn, uh, develop what they believe is right and wrong based on being involved with the humanity around them, with the people around them, and with the things that happen to people in our daily lives. So I guess that, that's mostly what the book is about. Um, I would like to share one, the first exercise that's in the book. Uh, I'd like to share it. It's very easy. Um, if, if there's something that uh, you're not sure what you're not sure what to do about concerning child, if you can think about that child and uh, get out a piece of paper and, and make, make two columns, one with a plus on the top and one with a minus on the top. And just think about that child, that the child who keeps you awake at night and you don't know why. This is the child you look at and you're worried about and you don't know why. Think about that and write down in the plus column everything that that child already possesses that you think is going to help them out in life. It's going to make them um, competent and, and happy and um, make, um, you know, it's talents that they already have. And this is not academic. This is not, you know, necessarily someone who's a whiz at mathematics. Um, this is maybe someone who uh, is, is very personable or um, uh, does very well in a group environment or is, is a very good public speaker, things like that. Or it could be even, you know, someone who has an athletic talent. Um, and it can also be something academic. It could be, you know, someone who has a very intense curiosity about science or art or, or something like that. So that would be a plus column, okay? Those are our kids' strengths. And we want to do, do activities that are going to celebrate those strengths. Now, over to the minus column, you're going to write in that column the things that you think are going to hold your child back. Maybe they have a tough time making friends, or um, maybe they're very shy, or maybe they uh, they just are really an abominable stiller. 
um, that can be there too, but it doesn't have to be there. We're talking about your whole kid, everything about them, their personality, their, um, their physical talents, their mental talents, um, anything like that. Okay, so in that minus column, we're going to put things that might hold them back. Maybe uh, they're rude. Um, and maybe uh, they have trouble dealing with other children who are younger than them. Something like that, okay? Now, in that minus column, you're going to see uh, that uh, probably relate to each other. If you have a kid who's rude and who doesn't have very very many friends and um, doesn't get along with people, all of those things go together. And that points you in a certain direction. Okay, so maybe the experience that you need to bring to this child is something involving a lot of people. Or some in some circumstances where this child is uh, going to have to follow the directions of other people. Because um, maybe he's not very good at that. Okay. So, uh, once again, it's, it's not us telling our kids how to act. It's, it's us bringing our kids experiences, life experience, that's going to teach them, um, teach them things. Uh, experience, it's, it's just the best teacher. That's how we learn. Uh, everything else sort of falls out of our brain. You know, we all went to school for 12 years. How much of it did we retain? Not very much because we didn't really experience it. Somebody just told it to us. So um, now I'd like to open it up for questions. Does anyone have questions? Thank you, Terry. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask in text in the questions tab to the right. Or if you'd like to ask on video, you can click video chatting up above the chat window and then click start your webcam. And then I should be able to bring you on screen. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll start with a question. I, you know, I, I was homeschooled, as was my wife. Uh, and Yay! <laughs> sometimes, uh, Getting along with uh, with my mom was a problem. We were cooped up in the house together, or at least in in the same area most of the day. How do you deal with that kind of grading on each other that sometimes happens with people who are with, with close family? I think we I'm may so have a lack. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't catch the end of your question. Oh, um, how how do you deal with the kind of uh, grating on each other's nerves that happens a lot with close family? Well, uh, I think that's going to happen anyway. Uh, we all typically live in one house. So that's going to happen anyway, but uh, that's part of real life, is learning how to get along with people. Um, I think we get on each other's nerves um, when we're not really involved in something. And the other reason we get um, on each other's nerves is because we feel trapped in our home. Is the audio coming through, Matt? Okay, so uh, we need to get out there. <laughs> um, send our kids, you know, give our kids uh, some money and have them go to the store and buy something. Uh, things like that, things that are challenges to our kids today, you know, get them out there in the neighborhood. Um, get them working with, uh, maybe you have a neighbor who likes to build furniture. Okay, maybe, um, and so maybe you have a kid who might be interested in that. Maybe that kid can go over there and help that neighbor out. Uh, just sort of 
you know, get out of the house. Do more things out of the house if you can. I don't know if, if it's winter time and you're in Wisconsin. I'm not sure, but um, I think that's what grates on us is when we're when we're trapped with each other, and we think with homeschooling that we're supposed to be sitting at a desk and or doing paperwork. Uh, you know, we should be doing a lot less paperwork. Paperwork is something that schools have to do in order to document what they're doing. Um, we don't have to document that because we're homeschoolers. We don't have to put very much on paper at all. Um, like I say in my book, uh, so many things that are written in a school environment, um, we can just do verbally. And it takes far less time. And then we can go outside and play. And we can go visit the neighbors. And we can go help someone down the street um, who maybe is disabled and needs some help. Things like that. Those, that's a valid way to spend your day. Um, and the schoolwork should take a big back seat to all that. All right, our next question is from uh, Sean Ridland. Can you recommend Calvert as our starter curriculum for our kids' first year in home? I'm not familiar with Calvert, so uh, I would not recommend any particular canned curriculum for anyone. Um, canned curriculum in the sense that you purchase a curriculum that um, is set up to teach your kid a, a, a certain number of things. I, I, I don't know. I think, I, I guess what I want to concentrate on is most of these curriculums are academic. And um, I think parents, I guess, need to figure out what they want to do academically, individually. Um, and, and if Calvert looks good to you, go for it. But I would say, Think about your kids as whole human beings, um, not as students. Think about your kids as people under construction, um, just like us. They're growing, they're changing, and, and they, they need life experience. And I, I don't know about Calvert, but I would venture to say that probably it involves a lot of pencils and paper. And, and um, that's what we need to get away from. I uh, had a brief experience with Calvert and it's like it was when I was a kid. It is uh, fairly formal and kind of tries to mimic what, what people do in, uh, in public schools. Um, Nicholas uh, Mejia, Mejia asks, any thoughts on the article about the woman that got arrested for letting her nine-year-old play in the park every day while she worked? Oh, I don't know the particulars about it. You know, when we hear about these events, you know, one side is going to say that, that this woman uh, was completely negligent in, in how she uh, took care of her child. And then the other side is going to say, oh, well, you know, I played in the park as a little kid, and there's nothing wrong with this kid playing in the park. Um, I don't know the circumstances. There are, uh, there are nine-year-olds who probably uh, can do pretty well at take caring, taking care of themselves. I don't know how long this woman worked every day. Uh, did she work for an hour? Did she work for eight hours? I don't know. That, it's, it's a complicated thing. I'm sure, um, and I don't know the complexities of the issue. But there are also 14-year-olds who can't be trusted to be alone for an hour. And, and there are uh, nine-year-olds who can be trusted to take care of themselves for an hour. We as parents need to quit um, looking to the government to you know, draw the line numerically and tell us what our children can and cannot do. Our uh, next question is from Tyler Lloyd. He asks, do you see a private cyber classroom as a better resort than public schooling? And how could they become economically? Um, 
Well, do you mean a, an individual cyber classroom where, you know, on basically online work, online schooling? Or do you mean sort of a um, private schools that would have classrooms of students who are all learning the same thing on the computer? Uh, he says, uh, based on the student and their needs. Oh, uh, well, in my book, I talk about what I think that the legacy of schooling is. Um, schools right now work on a paradigm, uh, on a government paradigm. Okay, um, they really don't have to cater to their customers because there isn't anything else. Um, but increasingly, with technology, we're, we're able to, uh, to bring our kids home and to educate our kids m much more easily than ever before. So because of technology, schools have really, uh, they need to step up to the plate and come up with some ideas of how they can serve their customer base because now they're competing with homeschooling and they're competing with um, online schooling. So um, private schools that offer online schooling, I think is, is definitely on its way in. A and even public schools. Uh, if public schools can get themselves to a point where you have a, a teacher who's acting like a tutor and there are kids in the class who are learning online and learning all different things uh, based on the needs that they have. Some kids are uh, way back in the initial stages of learning about math. Some kids are flying ahead to calculus. And if you can have that teacher acting like a tutor, that's sort of a middle ground for government to, to, um, to aspire to. And I think they should because uh, they're, going to learn, they're going to lose students. They are losing students now. Uh, BK Marcus asks, Terry, can you tell us more about how governments are discouraging, uh, punishing independence and practical learning for our kids? Hmm. Well, obviously, you know, uh, we do have, you know, the parents who are being arrested for their kids walking to school, that sort of thing, you know, the government is definitely uh, getting in our way there, right? And uh, I personally think most 14-year-olds would benefit by having a job, uh, but they can't. And, um, and the government is getting in our way there, too. Um, they're discouraging our kids from having experiences that would help them uh, develop and develop their independence. Uh, so all of those sort of things do that um, they do. That, that's how the government um, curtails us from helping our kids. But I also want to talk about the public school environment. Um, and what it does is it incur discourages our kids from building their own sense of right and wrong. Because when you're in a group environment like the school, the school has to maintain order. And so if, if you are disruptive in any way, you're bad, and you're not bad because you've done something wrong. You're bad because you're disruptive. So you learn that being disruptive is bad, and being quiet like a little stone is good. And that's not how life is. You have to learn how to uh, put forth your ideas and maintain ideas that are different from what everyone around you thinks and to cleave to the ideas that you think are right and to put those forward, even if that means being disruptive. Okay, this is what our, our country was founded on. So the government is definitely trying to make us little automatons. I, you know, they really are um, in, the, in trying to make our children um, orderly in a way 
that denies them an ability to speak their mind. Our next question is from BK's wife, Natalie. She asks, how has your time in the LAPD and in the Army informed your homeschooling philosophy? Oh, golly. Um, I think in the, in, in the Army, it was because in the Army, I saw all these different people who came in from different walks of life into basic training, into boot camp, and, you know, what the Army did to help those people fly straight. And it is, it is an organization that, you know, breaks you down and then builds you back up. And, you know, like they say in the military, you know, there's the right way, the wrong way, and the Army way. And they want you all facing the same way. Okay? So there is that aspect to it. But beyond that, they also very much encourage initiative and very much encourage you to use your own mind and use your own mind to get from point A to point B. They're going to they're gonna give you a mission and they're not going to tell you how to complete it and you've got to figure that out. They're going to give you a job and they're not going to tell you how to do it. They're going to see, you know, what you're going to do. You, you need to learn how to read the manual. You need to learn how to gather experts around you and, and uh, learn from them and figure out how to do it. Um, so, so the Army taught me that much. Um, and then in the LAPD, you know, you're dealing with a lot of people who don't have a moral code um, for whatever reason. And um, sometimes it's a very sad thing to see. And I think today we have a bigger problem with our kids being over sheltered and not having enough experience to build a moral code, not, not, um, not experiencing right and wrong in the world, not being able to look around them and see things because they're not allowed to be outside the house or they're not allowed to be um, out on their own. So I think it is really important for our kids to have those experiences. Otherwise, you know, the day before they turn 18, they're completely sheltered. And then the day after they turn 18, you know, it's a different world and they're responsible for all of their actions and they don't have any life experience to back it up. Uh, what are your thoughts on unschooling and the less structured forms of homeschooling? Like uh, the, the radically unstructured. Um, well, I personally know a family that unschooled and did very, very well at it. Um, you know, their, their children uh, eventually went into the public school system and were way ahead. And so it, some, for some people it works and for some people it doesn't work. This is what I'm talking about with parents having to um, make, make those decisions based on their own kid. You love your kid. You know your kid. You know what your kid needs. Um, maybe the biggest thing your kid needs right now is to learn how to tie his shoes. Everybody else knows how to tie their shoes. He wants to learn how to tie his shoes, and it's driving him nuts, okay? So maybe you need to do that, okay? Or, or maybe not, you know? Maybe your kid needs to go camping and be in a tent by himself overnight. Maybe that's what he needs right now. Or maybe he needs something academic. Maybe he does need to learn his multiplication tables around. So, um... And then with unschooling, parents have pretty much said, hey, um, children are naturally curious and, and they can go in any direction they want. Uh, I think it's important for parents to have that freedom to unschool their kids. Personally, that's not what I did. Um,
but I respect parents who do that and their right to do that. Our next question is from Brad Moore. Uh, what would you say to parents who are reluctant to homeschool because they're worried that their kid might not uh, be learning at a proper pace? Well, I would say that in any classroom, uh, you have kids who are falling asleep because they got, they got the material the first time through. And then you have kids who, after the teacher goes through it three times, they still don't have it. Um, so the idea that in the classroom, things happen at a proper pace it is wrong. Uh, so a classroom isn't going to guarantee you that. And there are days when you don't want to homeschool your kids. And, and that's okay. There are days when it just isn't meant to be. And you guys just need to go to the park and have a picnic or something. Or you have a family emergency. And, you know, homeschooling goes out the window because, you know, somebody just cut themselves and has to go to the emergency room. You know, those kinds of things. You know, it's the normal flow of daily life. Um, so I think you're automatically at a, at a proper pace when, when you're homeschooling because you know what your kid knows and what your kid doesn't know and what your kid probably needs to know. Um, and then you make that decision. Whereas a teacher who's got 30 kids in front of them, I, I really feel sorry for them. I don't know how they do it. Um, and the answer is, you know, they can't. And, and they know they can't, you know, some kids are, are asleep and some kids are, are not going to get the concept at all. You know, some kids, they just, um, maybe they just had an awful thing happen at home and they can't learn anything that day. Okay, if you were homeschooling, then you might put it off till tomorrow. If you're in the classroom, you forge on ahead whether they get it or not. And then they take the test and then Maybe they fail the test and the whole class goes ahead, whether they got the material or not. How much education is going on there and who's at the proper pace there? Yeah, I, I think uh, that if you look at the statistics on, on homeschool kids as compared to their public school peers, I mean, there's just no comparison to be made. I mean, homeschoolers do better on every metric. And part of that is because the parents are there paying attention to their children for that time. And th that is sort of a, a little bit of a selection bias as well, because those are the kids who do better even if they're in public school. But when, when you have that time to really get to know your child as a person and to know their learning style and the things that they need to excel in learning, I, I think there's no better way to uh, to really achieve that. Um, we are uh, running low on questions. Uh, if you have any, uh, get them in. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more. Um, what are your thoughts on socialization? Uh, I, the, oh, the wow. claim is the, <laughs> it, the big question, you know. Your homeschoolers get this all the time, and if you homeschool, you will get it from your friends, your parents, your in-laws. Uh, you got to make sure they're being socialized. Uh, what's your answer to the big question? Well, you know, experienced homeschoolers, when they get that question, you know, what, a, uh, what about socialization? Experienced homeschoolers say, yeah, what about it? Oh, I think, is, is the audio working? Someone has mentioned that the audio is lost. I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's still working, uh, for okay. at least. OK. Um, well, well, think about it. OK, if you're in a classroom, you're in with maybe 30 other people who are your peers, and you're sitting a foot and a half away from each of them and you're not allowed to talk to them typically um, and the teacher is lecturing 
and you're taking notes or, or whatever, and, and maybe sometimes you do have an opportunity to break into small groups to talk about something, okay? Um, and then, yeah, so how much socialization is there? Well, well there's recess. Um, I, I hear they're, they're taking that away because they don't have time for it, but, but for the schools that still have recess, uh, there you are, you know, playing ball outside or whatever for 20 minutes. And then the older kids, well, you know, they're just sort of hanging out in groups, talking typically, right? So um, that's socialization in public school, right? I don't know. Does that sound normal? Um, and, and then let's say you're homeschooling, okay? Um, because you're doing one-on-one -on -one education with your kid, it only takes about an hour or two a day in terms of the sheer academics. Everything else is practical learning, okay? So, you know, typically homeschoolers are going to be in groups. You grew up as a homeschooler, right, Matt? So did you have a, a group of homeschool friends that you hung out with? You know, and typically yeah. they're going to be families of all ages. Yeah, and I think that one of the, one of the key things there is uh, as a homeschooler, I was around people not just of my age group, but of all kinds of age groups, and I got a chance to socialize with younger people and older people, and I knew how to communicate with older people uh, in a way that my public school peers didn't. Now, from 8th to 11th grade, I, I ended up going to public school for a little while, um, and I, I didn't... Uh, it, it, it was a lot like, there's, there's the book um, uh, where, the, where the kids are on the island and they're just horrible to each other. Oh, uh, Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. Um, it was a bit like that in, in public school. And you know how I answer the socialization question is, uh, well, if you want your kids to learn how to socialize in a, a dog-eat-dog cutthroat environment where everybody is mean and everybody has been kind of incentivized to be mean to each other okay i mean but that's going to turn out kids who are not as good with communicating outside uh, their uh, their age group and they're going to be meaner kids unless they are just tremendously resilient and they they may come out with lots of emotion Oh, I agree, and I think I came out with emotional damage as well, um, and I think a lot of people do because because it's not a real environment. You know, you don't learn how to interact with young kids and older kids, and and like you said, uh, older people, uh, parents, other parents. Um, you don't have time to function in the neighborhood. Um, so, you know, that's where you learn your socialization is from friends and neighbors and groups and, and those kinds of things, activities that you do with groups of people of all different ages, not, you know, being cooped up with everyone just your own age learning, you know, the same thing. Yeah, I think one of the other keys there is like one of the things I want to teach my kids when I have them uh, is to stay away from people who are bad influences and who are just who they don't like being around. I don't want my kids to feel the necessity of being around people that they don't like. Now, in public school, if, if your kids are in public school, they will be around people they don't like, and they will be forced into a, a very closed environment with those people. And they, yes, they may learn how to deal with that kind of adversity, uh, but the ways that public school kids often deal with that kind of thing, are those aren't good ways, and they aren't ways that translate to the grown-up world. They don't translate to the real world. And so you learn this very kind of, this way of, dealing with people that's kind of divorced from how you need to deal with people in in real life situations when you're an adult. I, I totally agree. 
Um, and also, you learn, you know, when children who have bad experiences in public school come home and talk to their parents um, about being distraught, um, they're, they're told, you know, you just have to deal with it and find ways to deal with it. And, and that's not real life. I want my kids to know that if they encounter uh, an environment at work or, or whatever when they're older, they shouldn't sit and endure it. Um, they, they should get a different job. They should get a different boss. If they don't like their work, they should find something else to do. Uh, we're teaching our kids by, you know, by not changing their environment when it's something that we believe is not doing them any good or, in fact, hurting them, that, that they should endure hard things and, and uh, bad treatment and shouldn't do anything about it. Absolutely. Uh, we've, we've actually uh, gotten some more questions in here. Um, BK Marcus asks, uh, or Natalie uh, asks, uh, you've talked about how it is important to work on what you are worried about for your child. How do you help them uh, deal with something like failure? How do you help them become resilient? Ah, well, uh, we all have failure. It's, it's a really good thing for people to fail uh, because if they never do, if we you know, if parents only work to their children's strength, then those children will be terrified of failure, having never encountered it. Um, so I think it's a good thing for our kids to fail at some things, and then we need to sit and talk to them and say, okay, um, is the sun going to come up tomorrow? Yes, it will. And so you learn how to deal with failure. We're not perfect and, and uh, you know, we're not superheroes, so we all, we're all going to fail and um, you learn resilience by being resilient. Um, while I think it's important for kids to learn academics, it's also really important for them to learn um, physical endurance, uh, mental endurance, and, and there are activities to do that. Okay, you know, you can do some tough physical activities and that will help teach you about failure and about pushing past it and, you know, getting better and better and then eventually not failing at that very same thing. You can learn that through um, watching other people, reading about other people who have gone through adversity and having, once again, life experience so you see that happen in the world. You know, you, you see people who try things and fail at them, and you have to like them anyway, okay? You know, we are not to be judged by only our successes in life. Um, if we are, then, then we'll never try anything new because we'll be so afraid of failure. None of us wants our kids to be like that. Uh, Brad Moore asks, uh, do you think that the existence of teachers unions has had an impact on how teachers interact with students? Oh, well, I think most people who become teachers go into the teaching profession with the best of intentions. Um, and I think that the institution of school uh, tears that down because, you know, they can't teach what they want and they can't teach what they think is um, worthwhile to learn. Um, they have to teach what they're told to teach and, you know, they, they have to do it in an orderly environment. So we're back to the orderly environment issues, right? Um, unions in particular, I think the, the, the issues with unions um, have, you know, because of, of the, um, 
retention of senior senior teachers and uh, giving senior teachers more choices about where they can teach. I think the the effect on students has been that uh, students from poorer schools tend to have inexperienced teachers and um, we're retaining teachers who have tenure. I think it's more of a tenure issue than a union issue, but, but that's all probably, you know, all together, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I have a, a good friend, a libertarian, who's a, uh, who is a public school teacher, and she has been working at an inner city school or a, a very low-income area school. And she said, you know, just all the teachers there are brand new and everybody's just trying to get out. And so she, uh, she actually just today or yesterday got a job at, at a better school and she's escaping because the environment is so bad for both the kids and the teachers. And, and so when you have that kind of brain drain incentivized by the system, I, I don't know that that's the fault of the unions, but there's something wrong with the system there. All right. We Absolutely. Um, and Sorry, what was that? What we I'm sorry, I missed what you said. But I, I agree that, that there is a terrible brain drain going on. And, you know, the, the inner city schools in Los Angeles are really rough. <laughs> I, I, I would not want my children to go there uh, beyond the academic issues, just the social issues. It makes it a very rough place. All right, we uh, we have reached the end in, uh, of our supply of questions. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Terry, and thanks everyone for coming. Remember, everyone, check out Terry's book, The Secular Homeschooler, on Liberty Me in the library. I'll, I will link to it in chat in uh, just a moment here. Now, uh, I want to tell you, this week we've got just an incredible uh, lineup here at Liberty Me U. Uh, tomorrow through Saturday, we've got from 9.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, live stream from the, uh, the Rothbard University program that uh, Mises Canada is putting on. Uh, they've got Walter Block, Doug French, Glenn Fox, David Howden on faculty. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And then uh, Jeffrey Tucker, who is uh, with us here in chat, it also has a... Uh, a kind of welcome to Liberty Me event tomorrow night. He's going to give kind of a an in-depth guide to getting started with with Liberty Me. Uh, he's it, there's so much on on the site that people you know weeks in who have been active on the website will say, oh, I didn't even notice that was there. And Jeffrey is going, going to talk about some of that and talk about you know the ideas and the inspiration behind Liberty Me. And then Friday and Saturday we've also got our, our regular webinars, uh, one on altcoins and uh, cryptocurrency on Friday, and then on Saturday one on BitShares and decentralized autonomous organizations. That's going to be really interesting. And then next week is great as well. I mean, we've got Sheldon Richmond. Pete Becky, Chris Coyne, uh, Ed Stringham. It's going to be absolutely fabulous. So definitely check it out. I hope to see you all back. And thanks so much. Thank you again, Terry. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.